Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde. Ladies and Gentlemen, dear friends. I'm very, very happy that uh, the subject matter of tonight's panel um, and the guests have found such a big response. So I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you on behalf of all uh, the organizers. My name is Barbara Unmüßig. I'm chair of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And this is a, a co-organized uh, event by Brot für die Welt, Oxfam, Deutschland, Missouri, and in Kota. And I would like to uh, thank uh, these organizations uh, for this uh, cooperation. I believe this is a very interesting uh, and attractive program that we are offering. Tonight. And we are. Möchte wirklich ähm, noch mal hier sagen, das ist jetzt die Veranstaltung am Ende der alternativen Grünen Woche der Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Wir haben hier seit Montag jeden Tag. A, a sequel of uh, events, uh, Alternative Green Week. On the 8th of January, we presented the insect settlers uh, that you can get a, a copy of outside. And yesterday evening, we had a major uh, public event um, with the new uh, farmers' protest uh, movement uh, because we believe here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation that we would need to be discussing uh, 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 with uh, uh, the, the farmers that uh, protest uh, because we stand for constructive dialogue. Tomorrow, there will be the demonstration. You are all cordially invited to join. I hope that you'll all be showing up there. And after uh, that one, we will meet again. That is uh, a tradition already, the so-called soup talk. There will be lots of different uh, inputs. Uh, there will be uh, various different uh, uh, roundtables, discussions, etc. I would like to cordially welcome, uh, invite you to this uh, event tomorrow as well. And I would like to welcome now panel discussion, uh, the panelists here, uh, Emmanuel Atambo from the Route to Food Initiative, Kenya. Well, welcome. It's a pleasure having you here. Of course, I will present them in more detail later again. And then I would like to most cordially welcome uh, Reinhild Benning from German Watch. It's good to have you here. Now from our co-organizer, um, most cordial welcome to Sarah Schneider from Miserio. <coughs> and also a special welcome here to Antonio Andrioli from Brazil, from the Universidad Federal de Fronteira Sul uh, in Santa Catarina in Brazil. And of course, I would like to welcome Vananada Shiva. She's an activist, publicist, author, alternative Nobel laureate from India. Warm welcome. A different world is possible. Um, disobedience, civil disobedience. Uh, um, uh, this is a new book of uh, Vandana Shiva. Um, she will be talking. Uh, uh, but she will sign uh, the, the book if you want uh, uh, a signature of hers. This is already announced at this point. Vandana will be reading from this book. Um, and then. Uh, we will be uh, discussing here on the panel following this uh, lecture how we can um, manage to get this new, this different world. Tomorrow, um, there will be uh, thousands of people that take to the street here in Berlin and demonstrate for a different kind of farming. And all over the world, uh, for more than a year, um, um, kids, uh, students uh, uh, protest a climate policy that it's worth uh, um, called uh, climate policies for a l lovable and livable world. So there is lots of movement here currently in this societal debate on environment, 
uh, on climate policy and on how our global agriculture should look like um, and how we shape it uh, will going to be central. Um, I would like to, as I was already saying actually, uh, discuss on the panel uh, the question how a different uh, type of farming, of agriculture could look like globally, how uh, could there be a path towards agroecology? Uh, who are those who are uh, undermining this objective and how about the movements uh, worldwide who are advocating a different kind of, of uh, farming, a different kind of agriculture? Before I would like to pass the floor on to Vandana Shiva, I would like to draw your attention to that exhibition that you will also find here on this floor. It is uh, the um, exhibition with the title Zukunftsehen, Sowing the Seeds for the Future. This is a wonderful title. It is from the Inkota network. There are graphics and there are examples uh, that tell you what's wrong, terribly wrong in the current agriculture and in our food system. And also there are uh, t uh, videos here where uh, smallholders from around the world uh, uh, have a say. Um, I am now looking forward to you, Vandana, reading from your book. Um, I was already saying uh, that uh, uh, she is the founder of a Indian network, Nadanya. She is an uh, um, alternative uh, um, uh, Nobel Prize laureate, and she is an author of uh, 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 lots of books. Uh, I would spend half an evening here uh, uh, reading out all the wonderful publications of yours. In 2019, uh, her book in a different kind of world is possible. It uh, is now also available in German in the Eco Publishing House. Uh, she will also uh, have uh, hold the opening speech at the demonstration tomorrow, and there will be much more people uh, there than this uh, evening. But I believe that this atmosphere here is very much uh, uh, conducive towards exchanging. Uh, uh, with you. Uh, one and I know one another from a different uh, major uh, demonstration. It's like uh, Grandma uh, talking for, uh, about the past. 1988, uh, she was one of the Mandana was one of the major speakers at a gr big demonstration uh, organized by uh, a broad alliance against the policies of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The annual meeting uh, at the time and the counter movement then managed to get in, in 1988 to to take 80,000 people to the street uh, for what you still are here today for a different world. Uh, this demonstration in 88 was kind of like a crystallization point and also the beginning of an anti-globalization movement in Europe. That's fair to say. And I would like to also recall uh, what happened there. In 1988, there was still a wall in Berlin. Um, so that's encouraging because uh, it was torn down. And the, the world word uh, globalization didn't exist at the time. So we have to uh, uh, remind ourselves that with our protests, we may not have been so successful. Um, but uh, Vandana, you always uh, um, give us courage and, and good analysis. So the floor is yours, Vandana. That water or not here? Take the water, if yeah. you like me. Sure. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara, for reminding me about our long journey together. And in a way, we did put World Bank into disrepute. It still influences, but very quietly. Earlier it used to be, till we had these big rallies here. It is to be upfront as the development agency. 
we put WTO, the driver of corporate free trade, into intensive care after the WTO meetings in Seattle 20 years ago. So as Margaret Mead said, never underestimate the power of a committed group of people to bring change. So Barbara said I would read. Now, I don't read German. And this book is based on interviews done with me. And frankly, I don't know what the man put into it. <laughs> but if they've published it in French and they've published it in German, I guess it's all right. It passes, Bernard? Yeah. yeah. OK. So at one level, the interviews were about my life. So what I'll do is share with you uh, the book of my life and how Without a plan, agriculture entered. Because I'm trained in physics and quantum theory. And I did a PhD in nonviolence and in uh, non locality, which actually is nonviolence too. Because when you know you can harm something far away, you don't do the harm. It's when the harm is externalized, then you can be terribly violent. 84. I was compelled. I mean, I'd been part of the movement. I'd been part of uh, the Chipko movement, beautiful movement in my region in the mountains, where women came out to hug trees, say, you'll have to kill us before you kill the trees. And those are the lessons I've learned from my land, that when your life is at stake, putting your life out front is your biggest power. And no one can take that power away. The power to say no, the power to resist. 84, India had two big disasters. The region where I'd worked called Punjab, the land of the five rivers. I'd done my MSc honors in physics from there, particle physics. And by the late 70s in 84, it was erupting in violence. 30,000 people had been killed. It was presented as if it was about religion, but it wasn't about religion. People who were being killed were the ones who managed the dam, the seed farm, the irrigation canals. And as a resolution of the farmers of that time said, and it's in my book called The Violence of the Green Revolution, if you can't decide what you grow, you can't decide how you'll grow it. You can't decide the price at which it will sell. You can't decide who you will sell it to. You can't decide when the waters of your rivers will reach your field. Then you're living in slavery. And basically in 84, it was a peasant uprising in Punjab, which was then mutated into a religious story, which it wasn't. Same year by December, the city of Bhopal had a disaster and uh, it erupted in violence of another kind. Actually, a violence exported from, sadly, this country to the world because you have had the misfortune of having had a Nazi regime. And the tools of that nasty, na uh, Nazi regime, which was a Nazi, nasty regime too, was basically to evolve chemicals to kill people in the concentration camps. That's the origins of every pesticide, the xylon bees and the poison gases, the chemical fertilizers were basically the same technology of turning fossil fuels for burning fossil fuels at high temperature to fix atmospheric nitrogen. And you made explosives, but you could also make nitrogen fertilizer with it. And the slogan in those days had become, we don't need the land, we don't need the soil, we'll make bread from air. I have called the group of companies that served in that period, Hitler's regime, and I've done a map of them. And we call them the poison cartel. That's the hat of IG Farben. They were together then. They've become one now, and there are four of them. 
a cartel of buyer has bought Monsanto. So the world's movements against Monsanto have now to become world movements against buyer, and you all have to play a very big role. Extremely big role. They were together as Mobe. <coughs> Syngenta has merged with ChemChina, Dow has merged with DuPont, and interestingly, the same companies that made chemicals to kill people also kill those lovely ladybird beetles who are an amazing pest control technology. And your new report from Hendrik Bohl on insects is basically a story of the explosion of insecticides. People say, why are insect disappearings? I say, remember there's a family of poisons created called insecticides. Their purpose is to kill. So of course insects will disappear. And it's a crude technology because super pests are emerging and beneficial insects are disappearing. So there's always a treadmill of the next lethal technology. I have watched in my life three generations of industrial agriculture and the response to the first generation is the work I started to do. And after 84, I was seeking a nonviolent farming. I had no idea there's schools. I didn't know there were different schools of biodynamic, of permaculture, of organic, of na Matsunobu Fukuoka's natural. I just said no without poisons. We don't need the poisons. Because I had watched in Punjab how they had actually ruined a fertile land. Soils were dead, the water had disappeared, farmers were in debt. At that point, farmers are rebelling. Now they're committing suicide, and there's a cancer train that leaves Punjab. Its name is the cancer train. So here is a system of food production that was supposed to feed us, yeah. feed the hungry. What has it given us? It's given permanent structural hunger for a billion people on the planet. You had hunger before, but it went after the war. It went after the exploitation. Now it's structural. And we've achieved something amazing. We've created food deserts in the richest societies. In the US, they have them. In England, they have them. We've all also turned food, which basically is nourishment. In, in Sanskrit, we say, annam sarva oshadi. Good food is the medicine for all disease. That's also what Hippocrates said. Let food be thy medicine. All the chronic diseases that are affecting humanity now come from a food system loaded with toxics, empty of nutrients, and both affect our health. We are only now finding out that it isn't just the biodiversity out there that we need. We need the biodiversity within us. We are only 10% human genes. 90% of us is what I call the wilderness within us, the forest within us, in our gut microbiome, 100 trillion. Doing an amazing work, but they need diversity and they don't need poisons. So if you just give soya modulated into this and modulated into that and modulated, you can cheat yourself, but you can't cheat, cheat the biodiversity within. They need a very specialized diet. And each of them is performing a function. The new research showing that uh, the explosion of uh, neurode neurodegenerative diseases is related to the fact that the beneficial microbes have been so attacked by toxics like glyphosate, they've been killed. But they're the ones who produce the enzymes that produce the neurotransmitters that make our brain function. And the gut is being called the second brain. You look at the world's ecosystem, 75% of the water gone, 75% of the soils degraded, desertified. The UN degradation, uh, land degradation treatment brings it. The UNFCC has warned, we have a decade to switch. And when they say to switch, they of course mean out of the fossil fuel system, but the fossil fuel system 
is where industrial farming is based. The heavy mechanization emits fossil fuels anyway. The nitrogen fertilizers, which are supposed to give us bread from air, have given us nitrate pollution, dead zones, and the nitrous oxide that goes into the atmosphere, which is 300 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. And if you look at, at the, you know, the planetary boundaries, the worst rupture is nitrogen and biodiversity, not carbon. So we've got to heal the nitrogen cycle, and we've got the means. You don't have to blast fossil fuels at high temperature. All you do is plant a bean. And it does the nitrogen fixing brilliantly. That's why in our country, we've always grown diversity. Navdanya, the movement I started, means nine seeds. When you grow crops together, not only do they provide for each other, most importantly, they give you all the inputs as internal mechanisms of relationships. You don't need the synthetic fertilizers. In Mexico, they have the milpa system, same, the corn and beans. Our work in Navdanya has shown, and you know, uh, if, if this is kind of my political ecological biography, or um, this is my 35 years of labor of love for agroecology. And I had to write this as a textbook because I was addressing Indian scientists with the agriculture minister last year, and I was talking about what agroecology is. And all of these people come up to me and said, we thought organic was just about marketing certified products. We had no idea there's a science behind it. So the publisher asked me to do this book for the universities. Um, and we call it Biodiversity, Agroecology, Regenerative Organic Agriculture. And our work has shown that when you intensify biodiversity rather than chemicals, we can actually not just regenerate the planet, we actually can produce two times the food we need, real food, every nutrient. No micronutrient deficiencies, no trace element deficiencies. And when you work that densely with biodiversity, you have to work densely with loving hands on the land. And that's why my call has always been since 93, when I did the big rally of 500,000 farmers against the GATT, which became WTO, we said the small farmers are the solution. And they're the ones being assaulted by unfair trade treaties, but I'm sure Antonio will talk much more about that. Our work of saving seeds, doing agroecology, and having market sovereignty, sovereignty over your economy, deciding where you'll sell, what you'll sell, how you'll sell it, or whether you'll eat it, that you won't even sell it. You'll just be food sovereign, in your community, our farmers are earning 10 times more by not chasing profits. The ones chasing profits are in debt and committing suicide. We've lost 400,000 farmers to suicides in India. On the climate front, which is making everyone so anxious, I think I, we need to set up a whole avoiding climate anxiety by turning to care for the earth. <laughs> If 50% of the greenhouse gases from the nitrous oxide, the methane from factory farms, the food miles, the packaging, I mean, you have this much food and that much aluminum. It's unbelievable. Add all of that, and in Navdanya International, we did a manifesto on climate change and food security, and remember, Bernard, you were there, and we talked about this packaging as a rucksack of food. And I tell, I mean, our prime minister has this, you know, clean India slogan, Swachh Bharat. I always say, you want a Swachh Bharat, you'd better have a Swachh Bhojan. Clo, good food next door, no packaging. No poisons, no pesticides. You go and won't have dump yards outside and you won't turn your body into a dump yard. So the illusion of industrial agriculture to which agroecology is a successful alternative has been basically 
paved by very, very false science. And I'm a scientist, and to me, it's the fakeness of the science that gets me extremely annoyed. So they said, oh, green revolution grows more food and will solve hunger. I did the calculations. Monocultures of rice or monocultures of wheat produce more wheat. They don't grow more food. You've got rid of the chickpeas. You've got rid of the mustard. You've got rid of the greens. So when you take the whole basket, you're actually producing less. And what's measured <coughs> is called the yield. But the yield is what leaves the farm. It doesn't measure the quality of what leaves the farm, so you don't know the quality of your food. And it doesn't measure what state the farm is left in or what state the earth and planet is left in. Now, you know, the whole issue of the organic chemistry of plants and soil was evolved by Liebig. How do you call him? Liebig? Yeah. He's written an amazing book, of which I've done a foreword recently, in 1860 or whatever, 1880. And he's saying, I think it's 1880, he says, I taught people how plants work and nutrients work. And my knowledge has been turned into a commodity for selling nitrogen. At that time, there was no synthetic fertilizers, but they were buying guano and buying all kinds of external inputs. And he has said, that I thought science was about telling the truth. And I realized my commitment to science has to, pull down, has to be to pull down the altars of lies, of chemical agriculture, which is just beginning. So the first falsehood in industrial farming is that you need external inputs like chemical fertilizers, synthetic pesticides and herbicides to grow food. You can't grow food without it. So I get re repeatedly attacked for starving people. If we don't have golden rice, we might have all the greens that produce 400% more vitamin A. We are pushing children to our blindness. Not a failed experiment. If the first external input was synthetic chemicals, the second external input became to putting toxics into plants through genetic engineering. So the first generation of GMOs was Bt toxin crops and herbicide resistant crops. One was supposed to control weeds and the other was supposed to control pests. Bt has given us super pests and in India, farmers are literally dying, spraying too much pesticide because there's super pests in their fields. And Punjab, today the Punjab government has banned the planting of Bt, saying the bollworm, the pink bollworm has evolved such resistance that there's no way to control it. Now, so there are really, ag agroecology is an internal input system, self-organized. We call it autopoietic. After Maturana and Varela, ex industrial farming is externally organized with inputs all the time. If first generation was chemicals and second generations was GMOs, now we have the plan for the agriculture of the future, and sadly my country is the lab for this, so we watch it very closely. We resist it every day. Very often it's passed off as agroecology. And this is the new convergence between the old chemical industry, the poison cartel. They became the seed industry through GMOs and patenting, and now they're merging with the information technology and digital technology industry. So you will see a lot of language of digital agriculture. You can't plant a crop with digital agriculture. What you can do is two things. Have surveillance of farming, and I'm just fighting in India, an attempt to prevent farmers from having seed freedom by having surveillance through digital technologies. Where did the farmer buy his seed? You know, it's through blockchain technologies. Where did he sell it? What was it used for? They're trying very hard to have total control. But the second is even more serious. And you would have followed very frequently the debate on data mining. So what's happening is the Bill Gates and these companies like Bayer are hiring researchers to go take digital documentation. What do the farmers do? They thresh like this. Yeah? 
they cut the wheat like this. Then they're collecting all this data and they are dreaming of the fact that in future, they'll sell big data back to the farmer. And they're talking about big data will be the new oil. So they're still addicted to the fossil fuel paradigm. But now it'll be data. But where do they get data from? They get it by mining data from the farmer themselves. So I say this third external input is now planned is to fill our minds with data and to empty our minds of sovereign knowledge and living intelligence. This is going to be the contest for the future. They, they talk of artificial intelligence. What's artificial intelligence? You download, you, I see what you do, you download it into a machine learning and then you churn it out. So they have a few words that they make algorithms out of. Those words can be used to see what you do, the surveillance technologies. But these all words are also being used to then pump out hate messages. Facebook sold its data, our data, to Cambridge Analytica, which then manufactured algorithms to sell to political advertising. And this is how the US election was won. And there was an article that said, we have the first artificial intelligence president. But intelligence, intelligence means to choose. Intelligence means deep knowledge. And now there's so much research showing that there's emotional intelligence, there's ecological intelligence, there's cooperative intelligence, even plants have intelligence. They have living intelligence. Bacteria in our gut have intelligence. So the intelligence in nature is a new awakening of the science system, but it was always a raw recognition in indigenous cultures. The respect for other life was because you realize they're not less than you. Plants are not inert. Animals are not just objects. As I was climbing your stairs, Barbara, I was remembering 1990, 1989, or was it? Yeah. No, it was 98, 99 where there was this big debate on patenting of life at the European Parliament. And there was a person who'd done a genetically engineered sheep, you know, later the, the whole dolly thing. This guy said, and so we walk, I'm walking up the stairs and there's all the sheep, well, you know, with the, on a meadow. And he said, sheep are merely furry little factories for producing biopharmaceuticals. So, I mean, that's the vision they have. And then that's not all. They're actually talking, Monsanto's talking about getting rid of farmers, farming without farmers. And since Monsanto is now buyer, they have this image. A dear friend of ours, who's an environmentalist, has just written a piece last week, again talking of bread from air. And he's saying, we've got to get rid of farmers. We've got to end farming to save the planet. And therefore, food will have to be fake food, genetically engineered in giant factories to save the earth. And so I'm, I've written back and I said, no, you can't save the earth because by destroying yourself because we are not separate from the earth. I think that is our challenge. I think so many of the young people in this room, that's the challenge you're responding to, that the crisis that the earth is facing and the crisis humanity faces are not separate crises. The health crisis of the planet is climate change, is species extinction, is toxics everywhere. Our health crisis has the same roots. So reawakening our oneness with the earth in the area of how we produce our food is agroecology. Farming with nature, knowing that we are not masters and conquerors and owners, but we are participants in this very complex web of life. And for me, agroecology is basically recognizing that the web of life is a food web, that growing food with care is the highest vocation of our times. Whether it's in a little garden or in a school or it's in a small farm. And that's why the policy challenge really is to stop punishing small farmers through subsidies for the wrong kind of industrial agriculture.
related to this, of course, is the false science that is being promoted, that we get more food. How can you have more food if it's fake food? It's not food. It's anti-food. It, it, it damages our gut. We cannot separate the food we eat from the agriculture we do from the earth we live in. And that beautiful moment of awakening of ourselves as Earth citizens is what I call, call Earth democracy. And agroecology is the daily practice of Earth democracy. Thank you. You need a translation now? Okay. Vielen, vielen Dank, liebe Vandana. Thank you, Vandana, for this talk. I think it's setting the tone for um, who's uh, having which vision. Those uh, who want uh, agriculture without farmers, or do we have the right vision? And now I have a wonderful panelists here uh, that come from various different countries, Germany, Brazil, Kenya, etc. here, who can now um, how we think of uh, agriculture in Kenya and Germany uh, and other countries. I will just briefly uh, introduce you. I will not have an introductory round at this point, but uh, each at a time. I will, um, in the first round, uh, talk about uh, uh, the, the, the status uh, of research uh, um, on agroecology. I would like to start with uh, Germany. And I would like to ask Sarah Schneider to start with a big uh, alliance in Germany that looks into agroecology. Sarah. Schneider, as I was already mentioning, uh, uh, works for the German organization Miseria, um, uh, expert here uh, for uh, agriculture. Um, and she's also looking closely um, at the uh, 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 seas of uh, uh, the agricultural industry, Monsanto, etc. I would uh, ask you to tell you about uh, to tell us about agroecology in German research, etc. Thanks uh, uh, to you. Thanks to Vandana for setting the tone. I think uh, you have already uh, touched upon uh, so many things that are important for agroecology. Uh, this uh, concept has only been uh, coming here. Uh, uh, to Germany in recent years. It is uh, uh, rooted in Latin America and, and, and Asia. And, and through civil uh, networks, through partner organizations, we have been uh, discussing this concept, uh, a concept that is closely uh, connected to that movement for food sovereignty. In recent years, we have uh, succeeded um, <coughs> uh, to uh, place uh, uh, it on the uh, uh, international uh, agenda here. So uh, through smallholders, movements. Uh, so there's fruitful soil here in Germany for this because uh, we are dealing with multiple crises, uh, be it the climate crisis, be it the dying of species and uh, the increase in hunger worldwide. So agroecology um, as a solution has much to offer. And uh, one year ago, uh, um, from the point of view of civil society, we uh, published here in this room a position paper uh, with the title uh, Strengthening Agroecology for a Basic Change of Our uh, Agriculture and Our Food System. It was 59 companies, networks, uh, organizations, etc., that have submitted to it. 
uh, from uh, ecologic agriculture, from uh, and environmental organization, from slow food, some from the consumer point of view, looking at it, from fair trade, from food councils, etc. So what was a very important paper kicking off uh, uh, the debate, and it was a very broad uh, alliance. Uh, we not only signed this paper, but further developed uh, the contents. So that was the first important step in Germany. There, are, of course, were formulated also various different claims vis-à-vis -vis the federal government. There was a motion in the uh, Bundestag uh, um, asking uh, uh, agroecology uh, more strongly in the uh, GIZ work and the uh, international uh, economic cooperation policies. Um, so overall, it's a young, it's a fresh, it's a young debate, still momentum, I think. Uh, and what we have in Germany is practical examples, which are frequently not to be found under the title of agroecology, but are definitely part of it, for example, Solar piece, people that uh, multiply seeds and exchange there to do permacultural or organize in food councils. So there's a lot happening here in Germany. Um, thanks, Zara. Reinhard Reinhard will be talking about this more <coughs> later, I think. Because, I mean, uh, it is about the question how much uh, uh, land is uh, managed uh, uh, agroecologically. Maybe you can give us some info on this later. Now I'd like to turn to Kenya and would like to welcome most cordially Emmanuel Atamba. Works for the Kenyan organization Root to Food Initiative. This is also an alliance of more than 600 farmers, environmental activists, etc. Now, you are advocating the human uh, uh, right to food and for a fair and sustainable food system. In Kenya, 25% of the gross domestic product uh, are generated by agriculture. Many people uh, live uh, in and from agriculture. Maybe. Emmanuel, you could briefly sketch uh, what's happening in Kenya, what's happening with agriculture in Kenya. Who is driving uh, uh, what? Is there a debate on agroecology? Or are you uh, uh, involved in an, in an uphill battle? Uh, we'll be talking about this later. Kenya was uh, discovered here by the big uh, agro exporters uh, um, is there a discussion in Kenya about a sustainable, future-proof uh, agriculture? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Babran, uh, the organizers, for having me. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Vandana Shiva, for that uh, very wonderful um, opening uh, remarks. Um, the Kenyan context is not uh, very different from um, uh, from what is happening elsewhere, but I think just to just to to paint uh, to paint a picture so that um, um, you know we can understand. Um, you know, it would be expected that um, this conversation will be easier in Kenya and other African countries because we hadn't really moved a lot into the uh, the green uh, revolution and this kind of industrial agriculture. But uh, that is not always um, the case. Um, um, so um, the, 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 the initiative we are running in Kenya, and uh, my colleagues are here also, um, on uh, the right to food uh, embodies uh, all these conversations around sustainable food systems. And uh, we engage with, um, with, the, with the policy makers, we engage uh, with the public through the media also to get people to be sensitized. And um, on the subject of agroecology, I think um, in the way we do our dialogue around uh, food rights and around um, uh, issues of food systems and food safety, for example, uh, we try to involve everyone uh, because agroecology, uh, we believe, is not just um, about the techniques of production, but also the fabric of society and how we structure our economic systems, even in society, our market systems. Um, I believe it will be agroecological, for example, if you walk into a 
restaurant and say hi to the chef when you think the food is good, you know. So we are sustaining this kind of system, for example. So it's not only about the farmers. So we try to bring in um, everyone uh, because everyone eats the food and everyone is concerned about the food. And um, about uh, in terms of policy, uh, we also see there is no political support uh, from uh, um, the Kenyan government towards this kind of, uh, of farming, this kind of rural economy. Um, or, or development model. Um, there's a big push by the government to continue uh, now to take us further into industrial agriculture, which we are seeing already, um, you know, um, has failed. And, 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 you know, many countries are now considering to look at alternative systems. So currently there is a, a big four agenda by the government and it's all about um, chemical inputs. It's all about, uh, you know, giving a platform for uh, big companies to invest in the food system be it in value addition, um, be it in, uh, in, 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 in market access for, for farmers. And uh, this, is what, this is what we have to deal with every day. Uh, but we are making very good headway. Uh, now we are tackling the issue of pesticides, which is a big issue in Kenya. This, yes, yeah, yeah. So um, there is a very good um, uh, discussion uh, that is happening. And I believe that you know, this global um, dialogue around our food systems, how we want our food to be produced and how we want to access our food is what is going to really change and solve the problems that we have. Does the term agroecology exist uh, in your debates and are there food cooperatives, for example, already existing in your country? Yeah, uh, so what we have, uh, when you talk about agroecology, um, as, I, as I've said, part of the work that we are doing is to sensitize the people and sensitize everyone in, uh, in, in Kenya um, that this is not just about, about, about farmers. So, um, so this is a political discussion. This is about our society. This is about how we, um, we support uh, one another, so the producer and the consumers, for, so that everyone else can, uh, can benefit. But um, there are also organizations that are working on this, but interesting, interestingly also, uh, like uh, what Vandana also said about, you know, how, how open ring remarks about uh, organic, you know, what is springing up as organic markets, um, you know, that are more like, uh, you know, you can be compared to uh, the industrial model again, so it's more about more prices for the label that is organic, and uh, so this is what we, we have to deal with every day, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as I said already, we will get back to the issue of how far your country is um, confronted with a lot of imports of pesticides and who is behind this business. We will get to this later. Antonio Andrioli, arbeitet und forscht in Brazil. He works and researches in Brazil and has looked at uh, uh, um, bio technology and their effects on the agriculture. Uh, I would like to know from you, uh, Antonio, how in a country which is the world's largest soil producer, the largest uh, importer of pesticides, how uh, is there still a possible a debate about a different uh, agriculture? Is there an opportunity? Is there a chance for agroecology? Are there still important actors addressing it? Well, first of all, thank you for the uh, in invitation and to be on a panel here with uh, Vandana Shiva, who I really appreciate uh, much. This is a great honor for me. Uh, the first thing is uh, I will use the opportunity here for the, uh, to say that for the first time, if we have been building up a university if in 10 years with 10,000 students with a space as big as the Federal Republic of Germany with the focus on agroecology. Uh, we will never have the opportunity again in my generation that social movements want a university because they urgently need it, because they don't want to be dependent anymore from uh, funding from um, companies. Agroecology uh, has uh, um, been uh, created by farmers who, who one believed uh, 
um, uh, become extinct, uh, were uh, resisting the green uh, revolution. Green uh, has nothing to do with green, by the way. So, so uh, we have been building this now over the 10 uh, years with the help of the Federal Republic of Germany, among others. Uh, and these farmers are always taking part in the decision-making process and that, uh, and also in the knowledge creation. And agroecology has to do with know-how, traditional know-how, so that you can uh, combine tradition uh, with the scientific uh, uh, insights. Scientists sometimes think they know something, and the farmers frequently believe that they don't know, but the farmers are more frequently affected than the scientists. But in the meantime, they talk to one another, and they understand one another. And when they understand one another, there's an opportunity to create a, it uh, that we should use. Uh, because uh, we would need for agriculture more than what we have developed over time. So better production means that uh, in that traditional um, period, the governments ought to support the farmers because it could be that in the first years, the yield is not so big that you have more effort. And specifically in terms of know-how, here governments would need to help. So for 12 years, we had a competence center that we have been able to build for farmers on the ground, where the farmers could have a co-say of, of how the, uh, uh, what, what the curriculum of the university would be. 10,000 people now working in 45 uh, uh, um, uh, classes here and disciplines, and we do uh, cross disciplines. We have the problem frequently that people are specializing more and more and don't understand the big picture anymore. So holistic knowledge is so important. And uh, and, the, and the farmers still have that uh, holistic knowledge, and the indigenous people have that uh, holistic knowledge, and we could use it. And, uh, and Aristotle said, uh, the front is this. We need uh, something uh, uh, like a uh, universal uh, scientific ethics uh, in order to discuss what do we need uh, knowledge for and and uh, we need the knowledge to improve uh, uh, the quality of life for people, not against nature, but um, in harmony with uh, nature. I was very pessimistic this morning, and now I have the, the opportunity to be optimistic. These 10 years show us how we can do something, even though I uh, uh, have to say that is currently being destroyed. Yes, look, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. Uh, in the morning, you discussed uh, how Bolsonaro's government uh, uh, is ruining these approaches. Your university, your, um, your, um, uh, you, you are threatened as well. You are no longer allowed to, to say what you want. Yeah, but here in Germany, I am allowed to say what I want. So, and I hope, uh, and I'm very pleased that we've had these networks and that Brot für die Welt, that Miseria, that many organizations uh, have been supporting this and now, uh, and now explaining to the society what agroecology means because people understand now uh, that this is the only way for a future, that we have uh, food in future. And I love the word food. So that you come back to that old term agriculture, not culture, not just economy, but also culture. And that's why it's to do a lot with knowledge. And that's why it also has to do with, uh, with uh, awareness raising. So there's a lack of critical thinking and there is a, a lack of environmental awareness. And how can you do that by way of science? And I'm very happy that I've been able to say this for the first time on this panel here. Thank you very much, Antonio. Reinhold. Reinhild Benning. I would just like to briefly introduce you again. She is expert for agricultural and uh, animal breeding at the German Watch. And it is, I think it is owed to, uh, owed to you that we know a lot about uh, the combination or the 
the, the, the uh, interdependence of antibiotics and uh, animal breeding. You have, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, analyzed how much residuals are in, in, in chicken meat, for example, uh, of antibiotics. That sh is not the main topic here tonight. But, but since uh, you um, uh, have been uh, 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 driving the debate on an alternative agriculture in Germany. Please tell us what is urgently uh, uh, necessary in Germany uh, to be done in order for agriculture, agroecology to stand a chance. I mean, you could dream about this Brazil example here. Is there approaches to that in, 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 in Germany? No, no, we have to look up to the Brazil, uh, what uh, the students here have been doing together with you as convinced uh, sh uh, professors. Um, here it is only just starting slowly. Uh, agroecology means understanding soil, understanding how my soil works, what plant societies are there on a piece of land. Uh, showing me is that so compacted is there so much comomela in the in that plant so that tells me that I have been uh, mechanically treating this too much how much uh, rain worms are there and and just to just have a look and feel uh, how the soil life is uh, on, on on my so piece of land and that has uh, um, that you have that in in, in some uh, schools. I myself am a chartered uh, farmer. I was trained at a school where you had conventional and uh, organic farmers in Hauswick at the lower Rhine here. We did a lot of uh, excursions. We did a lot of soil uh, 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 probes and exams because unlike the conventional people, uh, farmers, um, uh, what this conventional stuff, what if you have a mold or something, uh, and what do you do? Um, uh, so th we, that wasn't available to We could only learn how to keep uh, plants uh, healthy, don't so so dense, uh, and uh, don't so put them so dense, and there may be after the rain not so much moisture, and then there is a, a lesser probability for mold uh, forming. So that was t taught us. Um, so Vandana said it so well. And nobody else can tell it so well. Uh, thank you for that. We have to live with the diversity, and uh, that is uh, the, the 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 wealth of uh, agroecology and of uh, agriculture, and also the, the the animals to understand the natural way of life of uh, animals. Our teachers said. Uh, that uh, a chicken was once a, a forest uh, inhabitant uh, in uh, the rainforest, and so they have certain behaviors. And uh, maybe the chicken uh, remains healthy uh, if it is kept uh, um, in the most natural environment, where, where according to the genetics of that uh, chicken. So, and this view of the science, um, you know, um, has been forgotten a bit. Um, I, my, f my father um, said he is a conventional farmer in the Münsterland, in the west of Germany. The moment there was a uh, uh, something like a worm in the potato, uh, let's do uh, as the next um, uh, some some uh, um, other. A, a, a cereal like oat. Um, so uh, so uh, nitrogen uh, was uh, not used <laughs> at the time when my, when my father was a farmer, was used uh, for building bombs, you know, and not for, for, uh, for making nit nitrogen fertilizers, but no. But, but he was, he grew up in, at the time uh, where these methods, these old methods, were the only available ones. And I'm very thankful that I have some knowledge uh, inherited uh, from him. So, But we have to teach uh, the universities now. University, Katzel, Katzenwisselhausen, it should not uh, be left. Uh, university, Göttingen here. 
uh, producing liberal thinking uh, should be uh, joining forces with Kassel Wittenhausen and uh, that they're doing now uh, uh, with classes and events together, that points in the right direction. Uh, maybe, uh, Sarah, you can answer it, or maybe you, Reinhild. There is public funding for research. Can you tell us how much goes into agroecological uh, research here of public funding compared with new uh, uh, genetically modified uh, 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 organism research, etc.? Do you have the figures? Oh, sorry, there's no mic. There's no mic here. We cannot hear this. No, I don't have the figures. I saw a figure for research in the U.S. and and it was one digit uh, uh, percentage range and will not look better in Germany. Yes, as far as I'm informed, it is also one digit figure range uh, um, of all agricultural subsidies here and uh, for research. Um, so. We have to check on all levels how knowledge is created. Um, uh, also, the subsidies that are going into this. I have already announced it. We had one uh, round here on the panel um, discussing uh, agroecology in the various different countries. Now, in the second round on the panel, um, we would like to go in more depth. Who are the drivers that prevent agroecology standing a chance. Um, we still uh, witness uh, currently no uh, uh, transition towards a sustainable agriculture. On the contrary, um, uh, developing agro industry in various different uh, 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 levels. And, uh, and Emmanuel, how does it look like in Kenya? At Root to Food, you did a publication. I can show this here, show this up, hold, hold this up. Pesticides in Kenya by our health environment and food security are at stake. And I think it is important to tell the audience who are the actors that come into your country and to, to do this agro industry. Um, I think. Uh it's a very, it's very, it's very interesting subject uh, now that we are bringing in all angles to uh, to agroecology, for example, because I think like people, people talk about agroecology should listen to people who also talk about animal welfare and people also talk about reducing animal consumption. So I think it's quite interesting that that is also coming up. Um, so in the Kenyan context, specifically on the subject on uh, pesticides, um, uh, so uh, uh, my colleague worked on this paper um, about uh, the pesticides, looking at what is imported uh, to Kenya, basically what is registered and accepted for use. And uh, we actually discovered uh, about 32% of the pesticides that are used, uh, registered and used in Kenya have been withdrawn uh, from the European uh, you know, market. Not that they have never been used here, but they were registered here, but then new uh, findings came out that they are not, yeah, that they're not good, and then they have been removed from the market either because they are not friendly to the environment or, again, uh, not healthy uh, to the farmers who, who spray and also to the consumers. And so um, when you put out this kind of information, you get a lot of backlash uh, because there are a lot of companies, uh, some of them are German companies. I don't know. I'm thinking I have a politician in the room, so maybe he'll defend me. But I'm not going to mention the companies anyway. Maybe you can. Yeah. I need to be safe, yeah? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm deported in the morning. So yeah, so there's uh, German companies um, and um, others, other companies as well uh, who are comfortably exporting uh, these products to, uh, to the market in Kenya. And you will be amazed by how, many, by how farmers use these chemicals. Um, someone would think that you, know, you can reduce the exposure and all the safe use. It's not happening because these farmers can't afford protective gear in the first place. They don't know. Um, some of them don't even know how to read. And they think because it's packed in a nice bottle, and especially they're usually packed in white bottles and it's kept in the nice shelf in the shop, so it is safe to use. So they look at it just the same way you look at you know, a bottle of, of milk, for example, because it's, it's sold in the shop, so it's good to use. So they use and, and you know, some of them get sick, 
they don't even get diagnosis and um, yeah so um, I think um, what 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 we see is a big push from uh, from the industry to continue controlling um, you know the inputs that farmers are using and the methods that farmers are using the knowledge you're talking about sharing from you know from from your parent or from you know from from the older generation going down there's a big push to cut that off so you know it will be labeled that th this is traditional it's not going to work it's not going to give us enough yields it's not going to feed all of us so stop it let us use science and and another challenge i want to throw in i mean if uh, you think about it, for example, in the context of, uh, of pesticides. Uh, I think more organic methods are more science than pesticides because pesticides are mere technologies. And I always use this example in Kenya and say, technologies are like you know, an iron box. Technologies are not stable. Science, like gravity, like Newton's uh, gravity law, when you throw something up, it comes down. This is science because it has never changed. But technology is always you know, prone uh, to defects. Just the same way you have an iron box, you buy it from a very nice, reputable shop. So today it does good on your shirt. Tomorrow it does something else. And we all know it has always happened to some of us. Yeah. So this is the same thing we are seeing. So we are removing the actual science from our food system from our farming methods replacing it with technology that has now been labeled as science so the biggest challenge we have also is to continue to promote agroecology not just as an approach from nowhere but agroecology as a science so we have the people have to believe that this is the science this is what has been done for a very long time and is not to be stable so that is um, that is what we're doing but we are hopeful uh, that we are going to get these pesticides removed. Uh, so maybe also um, uh, if you could push from this side, because the same farmers are also exporting here, and it's good that we can also advocate for the welfare of the farmers in the spirit of agroecology, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have Kenya in the well, last October, I traveled to Kenya, and I learned that in Kenya, there are hardly any data or facts available or research on how pesticides have an impact on the soil, the waters, or the health of the people. So this is something that we should point out here. So it's n there's not this kind of data collection and measurements like in Germany. So for you, at root to food, it's not that easy to prove how much pesticides um, have an impact on the health of the people, the soils, and also the waters. So this is actually a topic which is very important. You need research and investigations and, of course, labs that can actually detect what harm these pesticides cause. Now, Sarah, I would like to turn to you. Uh, you have uh, dealt a lot with Bayer and the market leader for pesticides. So Bayer is the market leader for pesticides. And I would like to know what all of us, we all, what could we do so that this scandalous state that the European Union allows for the export of pesticides that have been banned in the EU, for example, to Kenya or to Brazil. So active agents that are no longer allowed on our market are being exported to Brazil, to Kenya, to Nepal. So what can we actually do in order to prevent these double standards of the EU? Well, these double standards are actually a major problem, and it's nothing new, actually. So one clear step would be that there is an export ban at the EU level, but also at the national level, which bans the export of agents that are no longer allowed on the EU market. This would be one step. And in parallel, we have the so-called initiative uh, Lieferkettengesetz supply chain law, where German uh, companies shall be obliged to comply to German uh, environmental standards and other standards along the whole uh, supply chain. This is a broad-based alliance. And of course, there's also a pressing political debate in this regard. So if 
this piece of legislation, supply chain law, will be implemented, then this would also have an uh, impact on buyer. Buyer would be obliged to conduct risk analyses on how the sale of certain agent uh, impacts the right to health, right to food, right to water, or what kind of environmental risks are entailed here. And the company would also have to withdraw substances from the market if they identify risks. So these are the two measures. Would you like to add something to it, to the double standards? I mean, do you know how this came about? I mean, it's incredible that what we no longer want to have on our fields and used by our farmers and uh, eaten or consumed by our consumers, why do we still allow this for other ecosystems and other uh, countries? Well, these are different regulations and um, legislation which differs in strength. In India, for example, we have the case with the fungicide nativo, which has fewer warning hints in India than within the European Union, for example. And we had an exchange several times with Bayer, and they said, well, it's legal according to the legislation. And as long as there are different regulations, of course, companies will make use of it. Well, this is exactly the argumentation. We stick to the regulations in the individual countries, and what is not being banned or forbidden in the country can be exported to that country. But I think this kind of mindset should be turned around and left behind. And this is why we need this uh, signature campaign by you and also of you all here. Um, we need some activities here. Back to Brazil. We already heard it this morning on the radio, on the debate of the EU Mercosur um, uh, agreement. So Brazil is the world's biggest pesticide importer. And in the course of the EU Mercosur agreement, the it's the objective to reduce tariffs. And in this EU Mercosur uh, agreement, we have seen the concrete uh, proposal or rather measure that pesticides instead of a 14% tariff um, as before shall have a tariff of 0%. So zero tariffs on uh, pesticides. And so this actually is a clear support for our producers of pesticides. So what does this mean for a country, country like yours where soils are already largely damaged um, and what do you say as civil society in Brazil? How can we counter this? Maybe the only positive thing about it is that we can now understand how it is. I mean, this has been the situation for the past 500 years. So Latin America is supposed to produce raw materials, and then we, re or we import industrialized products from the industrialized nations that destroy our uh, country. So this is actually the agreement. However, that is so open, so avert, is quite positive. So everybody can understand it now. Before that, it was concealed. For example, the Brazilian agriculture minister talks about sustainability, even though in Brazil she is countering sustainability. And in the agreements, many things are being mentioned, beautiful, nice things. But now you can openly see that it actually is about the slow level of industrialization in Brazil and Argentina, which is supposed to be destroyed, that cheese or dairy products, um, milk powder, will be sent to us, exported to us, so that the small farmers, the small farmers who are actually responsible for the dairy production on the ground can no longer uh, maintain their production. So this is the way it is. We cannot uh, conceal it anymore. I mean, we cannot agree to that. We cannot agree to that. And the people don't agree to it. And the other thing which is quite a concern for me is how can we accept that here we say we do no longer want to eat meat in the extent um, to the extent we have already. But what does the agreement say? Well, we are going to import more meat. What do we say here in terms of carbon dioxide emissions? Well, fewer cars. But what does the agreement say? Well, more cars exported to Brazil. So what have we learned from the story of the agricultural fuels or biofuels? Biofuels are not sustainable. 
nuclear energy isn't either. So how long do we have to make the case from a scientific point of view and say that sugar beet culture is more um, damaged or harmed by pesticides than others? And the, uh, President Lula um, at the time said, well, it's not that bad with the bio fuel, if it comes from our plants, we will use it in our cars. But um, uh, I mean, he said it's not detrimental if we use it in the cars. However, um, sugar beet production has been conducted by fi uh, for 500 years, and now we are supposed to deforest the Amazonas in order to have 10,000 kilometers that we can drive to Europe based on bioethanol. So this cannot be sustainable. It's so obvious. And I was always looking for it. I mean, there must be something positive in it that we, I mean, uh, obviously there isn't. The positive thing is that everyone can understand it now. Everyone can see what the president of Brazil says on a daily basis. It's so obvious. And the people in Brazil have to raise the question, how can it be that German companies are happy about this government in Brazil? Well, this is also quite obvious. So here they can of course, these companies can benefit a lot from these huge natural resources if they are transferred or translated into assets. However, we should not accept it. Well, and uh, tonight, of course, there are more people than just we, the panelists. Um, I would like to say that um, this morning we fully agree that the EU Mercosur agreement, this agreement with Bolsonaro and the other Mercosur states should be abolished. It's absurd to set up an, an agreement with this kind of content in a situation of climate change and loss of diversity of species. And I hope that you will support us in that. <clears throat> Reinhardt, I mean, for years, we have had anti-pesticide campaigns, we had a buyer campaign. Well, damn it, when will we finally manage to be a little bit more successful so that these companies no longer conduct this d d detrimental business, which is not in line with nature, but they damage uh, nature? Well, um, this... Uh, Year, the year is a bit difficult, or the, the figure that you gave at the end of the agricultural industry. However, we are a movement that is growing on an annual basis, and the products uh, in agroecology are hardly lobbied for in comparison to the uh, aggressively lobbied for meat, uh, cheap meat or um, products made of sugar. So still, the market is growing continuously. People actually uh, realize where the contradictions are. Right now, we have 0.1% eco-agriculture in German, 1.5 million hectares of 17 million hectares. So, of course, we need a little bit more, uh, quite obvious. But um, what we do see is what is growing is the uh, agriculture based on solidarity. And I think this is a great model because um, this is in line with Emmanuel's request that society as a whole, so consumers, farmers, but also maybe the manufacturers, work together on alternative food systems in the region. And as agriculture based on solidarity can be a good example. Permaculture can be a good example as well, which can describe ecological methods. Um, here, knowledge is growing. And the Humboldt University in Berlin, I think, uh, has sent out an invitation uh, to this topic via the um, food Council, another example how people can come together. The Berlin Food Council was the first in the region. And two days ago, the Brandenburg Food Council or Nutritional Council was founded where farmers can come together with the consumers of the region to come to an agreement on the 
possible potential and the possible need and how this can be brought together. So this is why I think we should continue. Those of you who are not yet engaged or committed, those who have not yet signed the supply chain law, those who have not yet decided to attend the demonstration on Saturday, uh, Stop Mercosur could be on your banner, for example. You should just join in and we should start. Well, I wanted to s briefly say that um, Vandana Shiva, we have agreed that she will listen and then we'll have the opportunity to uh, uh, give a comment at the end. So we uh, had agreed on that. So she's not uh, just sitting on the sidelines here and being neglected. So um, now I would like to give you the opportunity to ask some questions. But first, Sarah, I would, and also you, uh, I would like to ask you to say a few words how you from your perspectives and countries so Brazil and Kenya would assess the state of the counter movement so what is happening in Brazil for example under uh, the current situation of more repression and criminalization of civil society in particular well I already said it this morning in Brazil the uh, Big farmers are the government. They are not no longer part of the government. They are the government. So this means that they are actually the big opponents of agroecology because they want to continue with that model, the enhancement of uh, areas of, of their ground instead of recognizing how harmful they were for nature. And this is very difficult for scientists as well. I mean, we all have to understand that nature is reacting it's it's a foregone conclusion, but however, in, in science, nothing is a foregone conclusion. You always have to justify it. And after I participated in the National Bio um, Commission um, on the uh, approval of GM crops, I learned that most scientists do not simply understand the connections. What has agri agroecology, for example, to do with food? This is not just science, even though I have to um, assume, and this is also what I explained to my students, this is the only opportunity we have to produce food in the future. We do no, not have another choice than an agroecological production. So this means that this is the most advanced that we have in science. But it's not only science. It is also about power. It's a way of life. It is a mindset, a way of thinking, and maybe this is the decisive thing. Of course, agroecology can lead to different mindsets, also to an economy based on solidarity. So a different relationship to nature also fosters a different relationship among human beings. So the um, interconnection between the human being, environment, and society. And of course, there are many people who do not like this, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. However, there are many people who simply do not want to understand how these connections uh, came about. Many scientists uh, do not know what they're doing. And this is also a problem because they were trained like that. They are distanced from reality. And the most stupid sentence that I heard before I came to Germany was from a colleague who said, well, you're right, but I'm not interested in it. So. Then, of course, we do not have a chance for a dialogue. I'm living in a different reality. So what kind of reality is this? And this is exactly the problem. We have to understand the reality of the farmers. We have to understand the environment. We have to understand nature. And we have to understand that we cannot continue like that. Of course, we scientists are also called upon in whose interest are we conducting research? And this is a decisive question for the society, um, for the large-scale farmers or um, in the interest of the small uh, farmers. I know that I'm representing the indigenous farmers, the small-scale farmers, um, and others say, well, I'm for the big farmers. So then that's the way it is. Well, great. One brief look to Kenya, route to food, this is something new. It hasn't been around for a long time in Kenya. And Emmanuel, I would like you to briefly explain what this initiative, route to food, uh, is doing. Who is um, supporting it? What is it doing? And what uh, do you strive for in Kenya? What are you trying to achieve? 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much again. Um, I think just to give like, um, you know, because it will be difficult to explain um, a, a lot of details, but just to give context um, a little bit, one second. You know, in Kenya, what happens when, uh, you know, uh, you know, before marriage happens, you know, um, so after a guy courts a lady and then they stay together for some time, the lady, the man has to go to the, to the lady's home and then pay dowry and then they come back. I don't know if it's the same here. So what happens is if the lady doesn't want to get married and he still wants to stay with the boyfriend, he tells the boyfriend, don't go to my father, he's very harsh, yeah? And then he goes to the father, she goes to the father and says, uh, my boyfriend doesn't want to come to you. So the father and the boyfriend think they hate each other, but they, you know, it's the, you know, the person in between does not connect them. So this is what is happening with the food system. Um, so, uh, so, so you find that, you know, the traders are telling consumers, farmers don't care about you. And then they go to the farmers and tell them consumers don't care about you. They just want the food you produce. And this is where we are. And, and we need to come together. We need to look for the people who produce our food. Um, so basically, um, in terms of the work that we're doing now, um, so we are pushing, we're continuing on this um, pesticides. Uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, there is a parliamentary process now in Kenya. Uh, there is a member of parliament who is pushing for, uh, you know, through a petition on this uh, same topic. And I hope, uh, you know, the government will get to act. Uh, but then again, uh, we have, uh, you know, an alliance that has been built around uh, the work that we do of people who are interested in this subject. So this is, uh, you know, the father getting to meet the son-in-law. So people come and say, okay, so this is what you do and this is what I do. You know, so this is, you know, we are doing the same thing. So we are all here to uh, to fight hunger because uh, all the things that we are doing are leading to uh, to achieving the right to food. And um, we have seen a lot of a lot of energy in the work that we do because people connect to the issue. More than 25% uh, of Kenyans are actually, um, you know, um, hungry uh, technically. Uh, so some would experience, uh, you know, uh, acute acute hunger sometimes when there's drought, and you know we still have some people unfortunately dying out of out of hunger in Kenya. So this is the issue that that we are dealing with, and we are saying, you know, um, even though you are not hungry. Um, you need to care about the other person who is hungry. Even though you, are, you might not be a farmer, but you need to care about uh, legislation and policies that affect the people who are farming. Because at the end of the day, uh, you also depend on, on each other. And it's the same society, it's the same system. And I think this is the model that agroecology you know, needs to preach out. And we're not saying different things. The people who are saying reduce meat consumption, the people who are saying reduce pesticides, we are all talking about this from a point of the environment. So we need to speak together. We will be the biggest enemies of ourselves if we continue speaking in silos. So everyone who is thinking about the environment, everyone who is thinking about food for the future, um, they need to have like, um, you know, a common voice. Thank you. Super. Schön. So. Well, I would say that we will collect five questions from the audience. Um, it would be good if you could indicate who is the uh, question is directed to. Christina Chemnitz, Inka, and others will come to you with a microphone, and then you'll be able to ask the question. And I would suggest that we collect a few questions. Please give a show of hands who would like to ask a question. And please keep your hands up. Please introduce yourself briefly. Well, good evening. My name is Robert Strauch. I am here for the Permaculture Academy as a collective educational institution which exists without any state funding and for the AgroForce campaign which lobbies for more trees in the landscape because the agroecology, even though it's now uh, gaining ground in Germany, has the problem that the landscapes, that the environment has been destroyed to this extent that we once again have to foster diversity in the environment. And my question is, how can we develop the necessary power together in order to withstand these forces. I mean, I was quite sad earlier when Wandana talked about the uh, incidents 30 years ago, and it became clear to me that this fight has been ongoing for a very long time, and there's a lot of sadness in it. 
And I think we have to uh, allow for it. And my question now is how can we come together and develop the necessary force and power? Thank you. Well, hello. My name is Henata Mota from the Free University of Berlin. I've got a question to Vandana Shiva. Uh, it's about the gender question. Vandana Shiva, you are a co-founder of the concept of eco-feminism. And in Brazil, Latin America, the feminist movement and also the women's movement is highly committed in an agroecological turnaround. And I would like to know from you how this is coming together. How does this fit? And it has already been mentioned how much is being invested in science, agroecological science and research. I'm a head of a youngsters group supported by the WWF uh, with uh, several million and uh, the project is called Food for Justice, Power Politics and Food and uh, Inequalities and it's about agroecology, it's about feminism and it is about food variety and tomorrow at the demonstration we will conduct a survey and I would like to invite all of you to participate and to uh, give us your opinion. We will give a feedback. Um, is there another question on this side? Hi, my name is Giovanna, and I'm um, interested in asking Antonio about the experience you've had with the formal education of agroecology in Brazil. I'm currently looking into the informal education for disseminating agroecology through peasant schools and how farmers can teach each other these practices and promote it and in a way scale it up. And I would like to, to hear from Antonio what was the success of this experience in Brazil that allowed it to become formalized and institutionalized and how the, that achievement was made, if I understood correctly, if you could tell a little bit more about the university. Yeah, Mireille Remes from, from Agricultural Coordination. I was lucky that uh, I could visit Antonio last October in Paraná and I could experience firsthand what the people had built up there, that they produce healthy food without any pesticides. And I have the great hope that the EU Mercosur agreement can be stopped. But my question goes to you, Antonio. Uh, what can we do in addition? How can we manage together to support this movement in Brazil, which has basically paved the way of which we can learn so much? And we are not that far here in this country. So what can we do in order to support it uh, so that these 12 years that you have already fought, that it can be continued, uh, what you've built up? Hi, my name is Angelica Hilbeck, and I'm one of the scientists that are trying to do a better job, and Antonio, um, and trying and call myself an agroecologist, actually, from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, I have a question I would like any of you to address the issue that my, I postulate your message has been heard on the other side. And they are reacting to it already. So we see a lot of cooptation going on, um, basically arguing or starting the argument from the exactly same analysis. So there is almost 100% agreement why we have to change agriculture and how all this is leading to, to a bad place, etc., and how we have now to change it. They come with solutions. You know them. I don't have to tell them to you. Usually using digital tools. And Silicon Valley has understood your message as well and is saying, yes, we agree, Mandana. We agree with Antonio and everybody. We want to change and rescue and save the world, and we have the tools. We produce meatless meat, fake food is what I think what you're calling it. How do you 
respond to that or how do you deal with this? Because it, I see a division going on in the agroecology field even. I see in agroecology debates that people are catching on with this and that the area is getting split. We have people in the agroecology movement who are subscribing to these new technologies and are thinking this is the way forward and we have others. How do, you, how do we deal with that? My name goes to Zara. I'm from the Cobra Network Brazil here. Yeah. Everything that Antonio was saying, um, uh, we had a big uh, disappointment here. In November, December last uh, year, the federal government of Germany uh, uh, earmarked new monies to uh, the Bolsonaro government, 40 million for the agriculture minister. We sent a uh, letter to the minister, no money for the agribusiness, for the agriculture ministry. Let's do a, a talk, uh, no response. Uh, so. Um, what can we do in order for our Ministry of uh, Economic Cooperation to not do this in the future? And how can Miseria and Brot für die Welt uh, position themselves more clearly against such policies? I'm not from a uh, organization. I am just seeing uh, interdependences. Um, in the world, if you're interested in the world. And I uh, would like to learn about the ownership situation. Because you mentioned in Brazil um, that uh, the uh, big landowners have more power than the smallholders. I know in the 60s, I saw a TV program about South America. And obviously, not too much has changed in the meantime. So it is difficult to not be pessimistic. And in Brandenburg, I just heard that there are groups uh, or corporations that are buying up land that come from China. And if that happens in Germany, I could imagine um, that this also happens in, in, in other countries uh, on an even larger scale. That's my, my question goes to you. Are there any figures on land ownership, uh, at least for some countries? Thanks for all these many, many different um, uh, questions. I'll do the following. Everyone on the panel picks the uh, answers that he or she wants to answer. I start with Emmanuel, and then at the end, uh, Vandana has the closing remark. Um, Emmanuel, would you answer uh, land ownership uh, figures here? And on, do you have figures there on the Kenyan situation? later sorry yeah <laughs> yeah so i think um, on the land scenario in kenya it's still the same uh, the same context there is very uneven distribution and um, you know the same question on uh, you know women accessing and controlling land so there is access but there is no control and all this uh, but actually also just uh, wanted to comment specifically on uh, one question on um, on uh, you know the industry responding and taking the issues that we are raising converting them into business um, so, for example, these companies that come with, um, I'm a vegan, but, you know, I wouldn't buy that meat. You know, what they say, it's meatless meat. They say it bleeds like milk, like meat, tastes, feels like meat, tastes like milk, but it's not meat. Because, you know, this kind of, is the same problem that got us to where we are in the first place. So it's not solving the problem. It's taking away the power of farmers to produce, for example, nutritious diversity of food, and then earn a livelihood from that. So if you give all that power to one company that produces, is whether it's plant-based or, 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 or not, uh, you know, this amount of food in a laboratory, what are you doing to the livelihoods of these farmers? So it doesn't solve the problem, and I think that is where we need to do a lot of work to, uh, to consumers, because again, also when you go out and talk about, um, you know, anti-pesticides, for example, we talk to people about the, the effects of pesticides, and then they go to the organic markets, which is again the same companies who have invested in these chains, you know. So it's not solving the problem. Uh, I think we 
we need to think holistic about it and and and, and when we put out uh, you know these problems also we try to engage the people on what would be more sustainable alternatives that will involve again everyone and not trying to get uh, farmers out of business because this is really the intention and uh, trust me it's the same companies that would that have been doing meat for example that invest again in this meatless meat so yeah it's the same business yeah okay thank you very much Emmanuel. Reinhard? Yeah, vielleicht auch ganz kurz zu den Besitzverhältnissen. Briefly on the ownership uh, for Germany. Uh, I would like to break it down on the animal situation. In Germany, we have the situation that 60% of the swine breeding company uh, only have 10% of the swine. Uh, and uh, there is a uh, chicken breeder. Um, well, they have less than 10,000 chicken, and 60% of the operations have less than 2,000 uh, swine, and are therefore uh, considered small uh, operations. So I conclude that the majority of the company um, is still does a, a moderate uh, uh, animal breeding that could be uh, transitioned into agroecological uh, animal breeding. And that instills uh, hope in me. The majority of the operations can do that. We don't have um, uh, uh, not too many uh, companies so that we can't return or can't uh, turn around. But of course, we also have this um, uh, massive interest on the other side. Uh, and they are closer to the government. Um, there's a power struggle currently, and we can only win it uh, if we turn to the people that have not been part of our movement. That's why we would need to use the big media, but also social media channels, because many young people we are losing otherwise. They only use these media, and uh, they don't lead, uh, read the, the, the broadsheets, and they don't uh, watch uh, the major news channels. That, well, we have to adjust our uh, news uh, uh, messaging so that we don't uh, lose these, the young people. And in Germany, we need a change of government. <laughs> well, this power struggle uh, in terms of land in Brandenburg, it appears to be uh, um, uh, uh, there's opposition. We have a new government that will have a law um, uh, preventing uh, land grabbing through external investors like uh, Lidl or Aldi so that um, farmers have better access to land. And that shows also the power struggle within governments. So we can turn things to the better, and it is on us and how many people we can take on board. So get going, get active. Very good. So uh, let's continue with Germany. Zara, uh, some concrete questions were addressed to you. Or maybe also a positive note. We need many people on the street tomorrow? Yes, yes, of course. But there was one direct question regarding uh, economic cooperation and how we can anchor their agroecology better. There's something happening in the BMZ and the um, uh, Ministry for Economic Cooperation. There has been a dialogue on agroecology and the motion in the Bundestag uh, asked for making agroecology a central uh, an instrument of economic cooperation, specifically in terms of power. Uh, uh, po poverty mitigation uh, in, in the rural area. So there is a, a silver lining here or there. But there are big institutions that are very sectoral. So in one area, things are happening. But until that uh, prevails, uh, in other areas as well, it's difficult. What we can say now is that we have these ecological uh, knowledge centers in some uh, African countries, and we will be looking closely at what is happening there. So it is a first step in the right direction. And what we do at Miserio is the following. Uh, civil society actors in Brazil are massively supported. Um, uh, they are the most important uh, advocates for agroecology there. 
And there was a question how we can uh, join forces better and how we can gain momentum uh, in a fight that's been gone going for 30 years and that uh, can make you sad sometimes if you think, um, if you see how little progress you make uh, uh, every once in a while. But I would like to um, um, look at the positive side, how agroecology is uh, becoming more international and that we have this full uh, room here. So uh, I think that the agricultural, agroecological uh, movement still has potential. And that, uh, maybe on the, on the local level you can do a lot. Of course, uh, what can be expected from governments? Not too much, but on the local level, I think there is scope, and specifically in terms of agroecology. It's a practical thing. It happens in practice. <laughs> on land concentration. One percent of uh, the uh, of the these landowners. I don't call them farmers anymore. These are investors. They don't they don't live in the countryside. They've never. One percent of big landowner have forty six percent of the land, uh, and the other way around, forty seven percent of the smallholders. Uh, it's more than 400, uh, four hundred four million families have two percent of the land. In Chile, Colombia, and Paraguay, it's even worse. It's even worse in, in that in that uh, uh, order. Uh, 4.8 million people uh, are landless. That is our strongest force in the civil society. That's the Via Campesina. We have the first campus of a state university on the settlement of a uh, university. And that's why we are attacked, because uh, the MSD is, in the meantime, criminalized. What uh, is it doing? Well, we have managed that the so-called agro-reform, that the redistribution of land, which is illegal, uh, has happened a little. There is no hectare of land uh, in Brazil uh, that has been given uh, to um, uh, the farm farmers, the smallholders before uh, there was squatting here by MSD. So more than 40 years, people have worked uh, to have a state-funded university for the first time. And then, uh, then we have a president uh, um, without being graduated that uh, founded that university. Now that these smallholders and the sons and daughters of the smallholders um, can go uh, to their own educational centers and that they are trained there and not at some university where they lose their identity, we're almost, we were almost there to have a campus built in an in indigenous community. Uh, so to avoid people going to university and not coming back. Um, that is exactly what uh, what's at stake. Now, for 10 years now, which is not much, we have achieved uh, something that was completely improbable at the time. Uh, you turned around the image of Brazil that at, at these universities, you had uh, at least 30% uh, thir of the food uh, we have five uh, cafeterias and 30% of the food coming from families and smallholders. We have uh, peasant uh, markets every week in the university. We have a program, uh, no special access for migrants. Maybe that's interesting for you in, 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 in Europe. Now we have S uh, Venezuelans, Senegalese. So we have special uh, places of study for for indigenous, for smallholders, for migrants. And that is the focus of a new university uh, which embraces the future and which envisage uh, a future. What kind of future? 
So for the big companies, it is already decided that they will base on agroecology. Uh, yeah, maybe they will do an agroecological packet uh, where the smallholders get the inputs again through uh, uh, genetic engineering. They have access to the most yielding uh, 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 varieties. Now, the corporations will decide what kind of agriculture, uh, agroecology. We we have will the governments uh, decide what kind of agroecology will have or will that be the civil society uh, Irene wrote lots of reports and I hope that, uh, and 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 she can report very nicely about our history um, she has the experience uh, um, from a campus where the uh, landless decide what kind of curriculum we have, that the farmers can choose their director. Uh, nonetheless, the government now wants to appoint the one that has the uh, least votes. But this is a feat. It shows that there can be a different way, and that unites us. So I hope that this can join us here. That's why I'm here. Thank you very much. Well, so we started with uh, alternatives, and they are available and they're feasible at this point. I uh, would like to thank the panelists very much, uh, Manuel, uh, Antonio, Sara, Reinhold. Thank you for a very inspiring and informative panel discussion. And now, uh, Vandana, you started uh, with criticism, with inspiration. You sketched the visions of the others. Uh, we have sketched uh, the um, alternative vision. You've been listening. You've been given information from some countries, maybe. So I'm very curious to learn what uh, you uh, will tell us here with lots of hope. works yeah would too efficiently um, um, I think the the last round of uh, responses on the issue of land concentration um, is so linked to a the design of agriculture to remove the last farmer from the land I remember when we were nego doing the GATT work there was a USDA uh, secretary who had written, we've got to get the last peasant of the land like you get last bit of toothpaste out of the toothpaste tube. Now that's been the policy because farmers, small farmers are independent producers. When we did the rally of five lakh farmers, Jose Lutzenberger, who used to be Brazil's environment minister was with me and he looked at this ocean of people and we were talking and we said, this is freedom to have your land, to grow your food, to have your universities, to be able to live. And that's why people's access to land has always been something that the powers have tried to disrupt one way or the other. Economic disruption is one. And pseudo-scientific arguments that small farms don't produce enough, therefore they must disappear, is another. The data is there from FAO. 80% of the food we eat comes from small farms. Only 20% comes from industrial farms. And all the land is going under corn and soya and in Europe, canola. 90% of the corn and soya is going for biofuel and animal feed. It's not a food system. So the question about how do we connect, since they've got so many farmers off the land, yeah, and they're working on the assumption that you will always be able to make the last remaining ones disappear, I think this moment is a moment where there will be intense co-option and Angelica's issue of of distraction, division, diversion, 
if you look at where it's happening, it's happening on the two strengths of the movement. One strength is agroecology, and therefore, like organic was hijacked by big food industry, including whole food gets bought by Amazon, agroecology is now being hijacked. And I watch it in India for the next step of digital agriculture, for the next link to global retail uh, systems of the Walmarts and the Amazons. Uh, we are watching it happen. And the new step of financialization of agriculture, which is where they want to go, where the argument is we don't have to pay the farmers a full price for what they grew. Let the market work. But we will let the farmer have some money for carbon trade so the polluters can get credits. Madrid climate meeting collapsed because of this carbon trading issue and carbon market issue. And they've turned our work on soil. You know, I wrote a book called Soil Not Oil that by putting more organic carbon in the soil, you actually can reverse the buildup of emissions, both nitrogen as well as carbon. They've come to that, but now to drag the soil into Wall Street and to make more and more money while enslaving the farmers more and more. But we need real farmers to grow food, to grow real food. And, uh, and my assessment is we need 50% people to be engaged in earth care, of which good food is a byproduct. You don't produce food. Nature produces it for you. One third, we've done research, one third of the food is coming from pollinators. You do soil organisms, soils rich in so, so organisms and rich in earthworms, produce 200% more with the same seed. So that is where we get real food. And we are really co-creators and partners. The issue of ecofeminism is so related to this, because whether it's colonialism or the industrial system, it's all related to the idea that nature is dead, women are stupid. And the rising today is nature saying, no, I, I can f totally destroy entire regions, entire continents with fires, entire coastlines with the, uh, cyclones. And women are rising everywhere. And ecofeminism is the way both on the grassroots women are articulating. Women are taking back agriculture and food, take, taking back the seed. And there was an ancient, you know, in the 42 famine of Bengal, the women led a movement saying, we'll give our lives, we will not give our rice, because the British were taking it away. I think that kind of movement is coming up everywhere. And just last week, you know, Amazon was coming in a very heavy way to India. And our food safety authority wrote an agreement with Amazon that the artificial intelligence Alexa, called the personal assistant, that Alexa will teach our children how to eat right. Alexa will monitor our street vendors on whether they are safe. So I just created a slogan Amma, which means mother or grandmother, Amma, not Alexa. So how do we unite? We unite around our humanity. We unite around one planet of which we are all. It's our common home. And we unite on the, uh, through food, which connects us no matter what. You know, as you said, the son-in-law, father-in-law. Uh, uh, but in India, uh, it's the other way around. The dowry problem is the other way around. Your country, men have the dowry problem. Um, I think the two areas where our collective creative energy can build new solidarity is first the ecological revolution. We are in, sitting in Henrik Bowl, supposed to be for the green issue. I think we need to redefine the green issue in a deeper way as a new pact with the earth and a new pact that we live through our work of farming and our work of eating. That eating is an ecological act, agroecology is an ecological practice. And I think we should definitely have a few absolutely focused 
campaigns. We launched a campaign on a poison-free world by 2020, 30, from the grassroots up, and it is growing. And in some places, regions are taking decisions. In some places, communities are taking decisions. But everywhere, people are fed up of poisons, and they're fed up of glyphosate, and they're just fed up of cancer epidemics. I think we really do need to start talking about 50% research should go in an agriculture that has, proves to, has proven to produce more and heal the earth and give livelihoods. We need definitely 50% diversion of public money to support that kind of food system that brings health. And uh, because we talked a bit about universities, you know, I've, it's grown. I mean, I don't build things, they think grow, you know. Um, seed banks grew and the and, and organic farm grew. Uh, and our Earth University is where peasants come to learn, but people from around the world come to learn. And we have a course in September from 1st to 30th, A to Z of biodiversity and agroecology. And I hope some of you will come. Go to the website of navdania.org for the courses, and you can find some flyers maybe outside and for our reports on the future of food. And I just want to say one little thing, that you said that the, the corporations will get the, you know, the whole new diversion of non-meat meat and cow-free dairy, and now poor old George Mumbia is talking about farm-free food, you know, farm-free food. This is what buyer, and we need a campaign in this country on buyer. We need a very strong campaign. This is what the head of their research has said. <coughs> They're sourcing different types of crops which we can provide. In order for plant-based companies, everything is plant-based, but suddenly, suddenly vegetables have gone and vegetables have become plant-based raw material. For in order for plant-based companies to produce at the scale and succeed, they require efficient sources of amino acids and carbohydrates. Not food, reductionist elements, yeah? Which will bring them around to raw crops that can be tilled and cultivated by machinery, the opposite of agroecology. So they need further intensification of industrial agriculture. We need to show that we do a better job in every indicator. And I think the science is so clear, as you said, that science needs to spread much, much more widely through the movements. That's the way it will spread. Thank you very much. Möchte auch noch big thanks, yeah. To, uh, Vandana. And much luck uh, at the demonstration where you are going to talk as well. I would like to ask all of you here uh, on all levels, uh, in person, um, become politically active. I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to also thank uh, the interpreters uh, for uh, that here. Uh, because uh, without uh, understanding, uh, oh, without language, no dialogue. So I would like to wish you a good, good time. Um, much luck with your campaigns, your initiatives. Vandana is available uh, here for uh, signing her book. And uh, there is also the possibility uh, to donate uh, for her organization. Um, uh, because she needs money uh, uh, for uh, her work. Um, good uh, ideas alone uh, and not enough to fund an organization. So see you soon.